On October 29th, 2020, the New Haven Preservation Trust held its Celebration of Preservation online. We began the evening with the presentation of the awards for 2020, given for outstanding contributions to preservation in New Haven. Following a brief business meeting, we then moved on to a talk by Elizabeth Holt, Director of Preservation Services at the Trust. Elizabeth gave us an overview an account of what the Trust has been doing in recent months, but she then looked forward to, to the future and to what preservation can and should be. We are making this recording of her talk available to those who were perhaps unable to attend or would like to hear it again. So here then is Elizabeth Holt with her talk entitled The Changing Face of Historic Preservation. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining in to watch our presentation originally given on October 29th for our Celebration of Preservation and Annual Meeting. It's hard to believe that we're coming to an end of 2020. And as the trust approaches its 60th anniversary next year, let us take this opportunity to consider our role as preservationists in a changing world. New Haven Preservation Trust was founded in 1961 when a group of New Haven residents came together to prevent Yale's demolition of the James Dwight Dana House. Designed by Henry Austin and built in 1849, Yale had plans to purchase the house only to demolish it and build a new mathematics building. The newly incorporated New Haven Preservation Trust challenged the university. The directors let the executors of the Dana House estate know they intended to bid on the house and raise any funds necessary to secure it. Yale responded. They agreed to preserve the building if the trust did not challenge the purchase. The James Dwight Dana House was designated a National Historic Landmark a year after the Trust's negotiations with Yale saved it from demolition. In its first decade, many of the Trust's efforts centered around the threats urban renewal presented to the city. An era of massive redevelopment began in the mid-1950s, not only in New Haven, but in cities across the country. At the time, aging buildings were seen as a symptom of blight. It should be cleared to make way for new modern buildings that would restore a city's health and vitality. The Trust's founders were among a small minority of citizens who saw value in historic buildings and understood how they link a city's past to its present. In these early days of the Trust, the organization was key to saving buildings such as the Federal Courthouse, and it brought awareness to neighborhoods, creating the city's first local historic district in Worcester Square. Like so many preservation organizations across the country and the National Historic Preservation Act itself, the trust's founding was a reaction to the challenges of the time. 60 years later, it's hard to imagine losing these New Haven treasures or that they would even be threatened in the first place. And this is something we should keep in mind as we enter this new decade amidst so much uncertainty. The goals of preservationists must respond to our current conditions. Society and culture are not static. Historic preservation can't be static either. In the trust's first 10 years, the threats to historic New Haven were different than they would be in the 80s, 90s, and today. And as this year has shown us, things can change so quickly. Historic preservation can't be about refusing to change. It has to be about acknowledging change and responding appropriately. As this is uh, the talk given for our annual meeting uh, 2019, I do want to take some time to look back at the good work the trust did last year, though it may feel like a lifetime ago. We kicked off 2019 with talks in January and February 
In January, Chris Wiegren spoke at the New Haven Free Public Library on his book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places. And in February, despite a winter storm that almost changed our plans, we met at Rudolph Hall, where William Earls presented Mid-Century Modernism, the Harvard Five, and a look at the modernist residential architecture of New Canaan, Connecticut. We also represented New Haven in events that were both citywide and worldwide. In April, we participated in the Worcester Square Cherry Blossom Festival. And in June, we hosted four walking tours for the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. Channing Harris led a tour of Hill House Avenue on a beautifully sunny day, sharing early drawings and photographs of what Charles Dickens once described as the most beautiful street in America. We then met in Fairhaven, where Bruce Cluett walked us through the neighborhood that was once a small village made up of oystermen, coastal traders, sailors, and shipbuilders. Even today, the historic homes and buildings along the Quinnipiac River recall the area's maritime heritage. The Autumn Street Tour was a special one for me personally as it marked my first time leading a walking tour. And maybe it was thanks to the cordies and raincoats that joined us on this very rainy walking tour, but I had a fantastic time leading the group down this eclectic suburban street. We wrapped up our arts and ideas events with Chris Wiegren on Lincoln and Bradley streets, a residential area rich with eclectic architectural styles. As I said before, New Haven Preservation Trust is involved in events that reach beyond our city. Last year, Jane's Walks were organized in New Haven and we participated in this weekend of citizen-led walking tours around the world that celebrate the life of urban activist, Jane Jacobs. And in October for Docomomo Tour Day, we once again joined Chris Wiegren for a very concrete tour of New Haven and a look at concrete as a building material that reshaped architecture in the 20th century. Also in October, to celebrate the centennial of the Bauhaus, Dietrich Neumann gave a talk examining the school's history and continuing influence, not only on the built environment, but its role in the fields of design and education. And these are just some of the events we held last year in our mission to educate and engage the public. Education plays such a critical role in the success of historic preservation. For people to want to protect their historic built environment, they have to appreciate and understand what they're protecting. This is why we do what we do as an organization. We entered 2020 with ambitious plans. In January, we were planning for participation in the Worcester Square Cherry Blossom Festival, the International Festival of Arts and Ideas, and we were already hard at work planning our annual preservation awards to be held at City Hall. We were even deciding on a location for our 2020 annual meeting and silent auction. In March, we hosted a talk why Modern Architecture Doesn't Matter at Bar. The talk with an intentionally provocative title was a rallying call to protect the sometimes misunderstood and often overlooked mid-century buildings around us. And as we enjoyed our first big event of the year, there were hints that things were about to change. That night, as we mingled and talked modern architecture, someone said to me they suspected we wouldn't be allowed to gather like that for much longer. And it was only a couple of weeks later that I was in the trust office, packing up binders and boxes of materials to get me through an extended period of time working from home. Because our direct interactions with the public would have to stop, at least for a while, 
we began thinking of new and creative ways to engage with the community. At home, I got to work digitizing some of the invaluable information the trust has had in its archives for decades. I scanned a few thousand historic resource inventory photos, which you can look forward to seeing on our website early next year. And I created new web pages from the beautiful house style brochures the trust published in the 1980s. During preservation month, we offered walking tours in new ways with virtual tours and interactive maps of Autumn Street and Beaver Hills for this year's Jane's Walks. And though we missed being able to host these walks in person, they're now available on our website for you to enjoy anytime. And luckily not everything had to change. Even in lockdown, I was able to continue helping homeowners through Zoom meetings and phone calls with their restoration projects, advising them through historic district commission and tax credit applications. And the trust continued to award its historic structures fund grant to homeowners throughout the city for projects like this porch restoration. But today, months into a new decade that we were all so hopeful for, things haven't gone according to plan. In many ways, 2020 has shined a spotlight on issues within historic preservation that we have needed to address for years. When we talk about historic preservation, we often get caught up on the details of physically preserving a building, the height of a railing or the style of a window. And don't get me wrong, these details are absolutely important. But we also have to address the history behind what we seek to preserve. History is often painful. Sometimes it's unpleasant. It can challenge us to face hard truths about how we've gotten where we are today. But we can't preserve in a bubble without acknowledging certain facts about our culture and society. Who are we preserving our cities for and why? Jane Jacobs wrote that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. The same is true of preservation. Preservation can be and must be for everyone. In January this year, preservationists were on the defensive after an opinion piece was published in the New York Times. When historic preservation hurts cities, argued that preservation obstructs change for the better, focusing on the challenge homeowners sometimes face when installing solar panels on their homes in historic districts. But the focus didn't remain on solar panels. The article leaned into the prevailing school of thought that preservation is an elitist practice one designed to preserve a lifestyle of urban affluence. Preservation can't only be about the well-preserved homes of the 1%. There's so much more at stake. The planet is changing, temperatures are rising, and shorelines are creeping into communities. Of course, solar panels on a single house will not solve the challenge of climate change. But as with so many things, every little bit counts. I'm reminded of a quote by transcendentalist writer, Henry David Thoreau. What good is a house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? Our preservation efforts will be for nothing if our cities become uninhabitable in the coming century. So how do we address this apparent conflict of interest between preservation and conservation. It's a question of both policy and practice. One person alone cannot change the policy of local historic districts across the country. But we must be prepared to allow some amount of change, lest we lose our historic buildings altogether. It's true that there are no absolutes. There are certainly times that the bottom line will win 
historic buildings will be demolished and new construction will take their place. But in a time when we are so focused on keeping straws and plastic bags out of landfills, shouldn't we also strive to keep entire buildings from being thrown away? Architectural salvage can only do so much when buildings are demolished. There is no substitute for old growth wood and handcrafted details. And you can't salvage the embodied energy found in these old structures. Historic preservation is an inherently green practice. It's time to start spreading this message beyond our preservation circle instead of just preaching to the choir. I don't want to use the word unprecedented, but this year has challenged us all. Personally, professionally, financially, everyone has been affected. In a year fraught with so much turmoil and injustice, historic preservation can feel less important than other social issues. How do we focus on the fight to preserve original wood windows when people have lost jobs, homes, and loved ones? It isn't easy to argue that buildings are more important than human life. Though earlier this year, an unfortunate article in the Philadelphia Inquirer challenged this idea with significant and deserved backlash. But it's here that we should focus on the true ideals of historic preservation. We're often accused of being obsessed with the past, wanting to preserve it in amber, allowing nothing to change. In reality, we are constantly thinking of the future. What will we regret losing if we don't act now? What must we say, even if we don't have a use for it now? Sometimes preservation is about hitting the pause button, not acting rashly to demolish buildings because they aren't a quick fix. Knowing that if we only wait and not demand results immediately, we can seek solutions that honor history while serving the needs of the present and of the future. Preservation takes patience. And that's something we've all needed this year. In early October, we shared our virtual tour for Docomomo Tour Day. In the tour, we celebrate buildings across the city that will turn 50 years old in the coming decade. And call on the community to ensure their preservation and place in New Haven history before they are threatened or lost forever. In many ways, the things I've talked about here all lead back to modernism. As I mentioned earlier, our very last in-person event was the talk at bar, why modern architecture doesn't matter. In the talk, my colleague, Mike Stallmeyer and I discussed the ways in which modern architecture has been overlooked and carries the perception that it's unworthy of preservation. It sometimes even seems that the need to preserve these mid-century buildings came upon us as a surprise. But these buildings have been here for decades, some now for 50 years or more. Modern architecture challenges us to see beyond the familiar and the comfortable. It asks us to not act rashly, to take time to understand them and to live with them. Creative uses for these buildings do exist, for those willing to think outside the concrete box. For those of you who did attend that lecture, you might remember the parallels I drew between one very big loss and one very big win for modern architecture in New Haven this year. The fight to save the former Webster Bank may have been lost before it truly began. The building sat vacant on Elm Street for years. National Register listing for which it was eligible in 1998 could have helped make a case for its preservation. The trust was involved in negotiations to prevent its loss for years, but it unfortunately was demolished this spring. And in a cruel twist of fate, the very industry that sought to replace it can no longer afford to build the uninspired hotel that was planned for the site. 
Only time will tell if the corner of Elm and Orange Streets will be a parking lot for years to come. But it's sometimes our failures that make our successes all the more worth celebrating. 2020 has been an exciting year for the Pirelli Building. The recommendation to list the Pirelli Building on the National Register of Historic Places was sent to the National Park Service in September. Constructed between 1968 and 1970, it's just reached the 50 year mark for eligibility to be listed, though I could easily argue the building has been significant to New Haven for decades. And perhaps even more exciting, construction on the Hotel Marcel began earlier this year, proving that there is future life in modern architecture. And all of this less than 20 years after the entire building was nearly demolished. And in spite of the fact that some might refer to it as Connecticut's ugliest building, a sentiment I certainly don't share. It's in the story of the Pirelli building that we can learn a lesson in preservation. The building has been hated, partially demolished, narrowly saved from complete loss and abandoned. It's taken patience, understanding, appreciation, and creativity to bring it back and cement the Pirelli building as a New Haven icon. And we should carry all of these things with us in our future preservation endeavors. And on that note, I wanna thank you all for your support of the trust and of preservation in New Haven every year, but especially this year, which has challenged us all in new and unexpected ways. From all of us at New Haven Preservation Trust, we wish you well and look forward to seeing you again in the coming year.